Top Chef winner, author of Christian Kish Cooking, chef partner of Arlo Gray Restaurant in Austin, and host of Restaurants at the End of the World, Christian Kish, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm, I'm amazing. Um, I had such a great time watching your show and I was just wondering, how, how did you make it to the restaurants at the end of the world? You know, there's a, I mean, there's a, a journey involved and I feel like a lot of the restaurants that we chose or that would, were chosen on behalf of me, um, our amazing creative department, they, they wanted the journey to start when I got off the airplane. So it was meant to have like this long trek in order to get somewhere. Um, you know, when a, re when a show titles restaurants at the end of the world, you can mm -hmm. only assume that it takes a little bit of time to get there. Um, and so it was, it, you know, a wonderful creative team found these magical places that were worth exploring. Um, and most of them took two or three flights or a boat ride and or a boat ride to get me all the way to this place. So um, it, was, it was a trek, but it's definitely a journey. You know, you, you said that you've, you've worked in some, um, some, some pretty difficult kitchens mm -hmm. and those experiences made you a better chef. What's, 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 what's a difficult kitchen? Wow, I'm, <laughs> okay, well, how much time do we have? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I think there's a lot of, there's so many different kinds of kitchens and styles of kitchens. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, what may be difficult for me could be something really easy for somebody else. But I think okay. you have to find the right spot for you and how you like to learn and how you like to work. So for me, it was a bit difficult. Um, you know, I've, there were challenges, you know, being a woman in the kitchen coming up and during the time I was, um, you know, had some challenges. Um, and so mostly from all those different challenges and difficulties, I, def I definitely learned what I didn't want. So I was able to kind of weed out the things that weren't working to help me narrow in on what I actually wanted. I like places where people scream. You like, do. I See, like I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that. Yeah. I, um, you know, I think... Where's the cilantro? <laughs> Where's the cilantro? Is the kind of kitchen I would want to be in. I mean, there's people that thrive in that, <laughs> truly. There's people that need, like, that kind of feedback in order to feel like they're learning something. Mm -hmm. I'm not that kind of chef, and I don't... I, I personally will, like, shut down. So the second anything goes above, like, a decibel that my ear can't handle, I shut down and I'd probably leave. Oh, you go <laughs> to the next level in your show you're like climbing mountains and you're deep sea diving yeah. and i just i wanted to know um has that always been a part of who you are or did you have to develop into sure. this um super chef <laughs> yeah i mean it's definitely not on the things of of, of must-haves when you're trying to be a chef mm -hmm. by by any means but I think for me, when traveling comes about, like I do like to explore. I'm very curious. I like a little bit of adventure. Um, my risk assessment has definitely changed. Just as I've gotten older, I'm mm. a little bit less inclined to do the more dangerous things. Um, but having National Geographic, um, obviously setting things up and making right. sure I'm safe and having a safety net, both literally and figuratively, really helps me dive in, um, pun intended, dive in without too much fear. So I'm set up for success in all the right ways. Um, so with all that, you know, all those different layers of, of preparation, I feel eager to, to kind of do these adventurous things. Does it make the food more meaningful? Because I kind of had, I've had an experience and I, it was like a reverse effect. Oh, so really? I'll, I'll tell you mine, yeah. I'll tell you mine. So I was a kid, um, my grandfather was in Baltimore, but he's a North Carolina guy. Uh -huh. And there was no food in the house. And I kept saying, oh, there's no food in the house. There's no food in the house. There's no food in the house. And my grandma, um, she used to fry crabs like every Friday, mm. but she was like doing some church like function or something. And she just wasn't there. And it was up to him. So we went to the park, which is like maybe like three blocks away from the crib. And this is a city. This is not like, you know, sure. it's not North Carolina. Um, the backwoods of North Carolina. Yeah. And he took his gun and he shot a squirrel. Okay. And then he'd bring it home, uh -huh. he chopped the tail off, he said, hey, go play with this shit. And then he like <laughs> cooked it and like, that was extreme for me. And I was like, yo, like, so one, I don't think I ever ate squirrel, but if you gave it to me, I'm kind of like offended. And then two, like, I don't know, I couldn't eat it. Uh, so, I didn't turn to a vegan. Sure, there, there's, I mean, there's a lot of layers involved in that story. <laughs> that I don't know if they necessarily translate to my experience, but, but generally speaking, 
what I'm gathering, <laughs> like, uh, for me, I'd be like, oh, cool. Like, this is, y yes, things for me taste better, or I'm more eager to try something that had all the effort or um, something behind it. So, you know, throw me with your grandfather and, and let me go play with a squirrel tail, and I'd probably yeah. eat the squirrel. <laughs> he didn't make the show, but, but, but you've had some, uh, some really, really, really delicious looking food on the show with some conversations with some fascinating people. Um, what are some of the things that our viewers can, can look forward to? Some of the most memorable moments for you? You know, I think a lot of the memorable moments for me are lie in the people, less about the food. The food, mm. of course, is delicious, and there's a great story behind it, and it takes effort to get there. Um, but for me, the most inter interesting part um, and the most impressive part are meeting and hanging out with these people and just understanding who they are, where they came from, and how they're actually developing these restaurants, you know, cut off from the supply chains. So for me, I think the, the, the people are the most interesting portion of all this. And just hearing a different perspective, whether we see eye to eye on it or we don't. I mean, that doesn't really matter. It's just being able to experience someone else's life with them. Yeah, the why people do things always makes it mm -hmm. that much more interesting. Um, you were hanging out in polar bear territory, yeah. uh, which was like, also, it's not on my bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, it, was there anything that was like so wild that the producers asked you to do and you're like, mm -hmm. okay, no, nah, I'm not I'm not jumping out of the airplane and, you know. Or <laughs> you know, for, for these, first, these first episodes, there was nothing that they asked that I was like, I don't know. I will say one of the, the, the things that ugh, bothers me a lot mm -hmm. are mosquitoes. Oh, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? And so when they're like, what's let's that, go. What's that Do they have a purpose? D I don't know. What to, just to annoy humans <laughs> and leave giant welts on people's bodies. Uh, so when they're like, let's go hiking in the jungle, that for me is more terrifying than, hey, let's go diving where that polar bear just was spotted. Okay. So, you know, the mosquitoes for me, biggest challenge, I think. Mm. How have you changed since doing, like, going on these, these, these trips mm -hmm. and these adventures? You know, I think I'd, I'd like to think that I'm a relatively empathetic human being and that I have a drive and curiosity for other people. Um, I'd say that this is just solidifying that and really grounding it in the fact that I do really enjoy walking the shoes of somebody else and learning something new in the process because, you know, what better way to learn about a place, someone's history, someone's culture, their, their likes, their dislikes, than to do it right there with them. And to be able to, you know, have the great fortune of being able to do that by way of food and something that I am incredibly passionate about, I think there's no greater combination of um, human storytelling and great food. Absolutely. Um, it's just like it was some of the interviews uh, that you did while I was watching the show. It just felt like you just knew some of those people like forever. Mm -hmm. You know what's... I, <laughs> When we start filming, I'm there in every city for roughly, it's about a 10 day period. So that includes a little bit of travel on both ends, but I'm filming with them six days a week. I have a day off and mostly I hang out with them. Mm -hmm. So the adventure doesn't stop. And I think being able to build that rapport and that friendship truly um, only aids us in becoming better on camera together and helping them tell their stories. So, you know, the, the camera turns off and the adventure definitely does not stop. They keep they keep taking me around. I feel like over the years, um, like we know Anthony Bourdain was, yeah. was trained in, in the kitchen, and over the years, his show just created um, a, a different, a whole different lane for him in his career. Do you do you feel like your identity as a chef has changed since you know mm -hmm. the taping of the show? Sure, I think anytime you know, television was never my goal. Um, it just kind of happened and things started rolling. You know, it started with Top Chef and going on competing and then things just started to happen. And so you, we have icons and, and true curators and creators of food and travel space like Anthony Bourdain and someone to look up to um, that he, I mean, he's just absolutely phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Um, but my, I think I have changed as a chef simply because I have to think more about other things than just the food. Mm -hmm. And so when you're out there, you know, like I'm saying, we're, we're dealing with food and food is a vehicle to help tell a story, but really we're creating a relationship with another human being. And I think that already takes you out of the kitchen um, and exercises a lot of different skills that you tap into. Because, you know, 
not for nothing when you're stuck in a kitchen and you're cooking day in day out seven days a week with no days off right. you know human interaction is with your coworkers, right. <laughs> and like the the idea of being able to adventure out and learn about people um you know is is a little less frequent how do chefs deal with conflict like with those relationships mm -hmm. because like obviously you're super talented you want top chef like you know um but there's other chefs who are talented as well and i know like the philosophies are, are kind of different mm -hmm. um what, what is that like you know, I think it's just, I mean, every single person is different. So no matter where, you know, what kind of kitchen you land in or what kind of um, team you're working with, everyone's bringing their own flavor mm -hmm. and their own personality to their environment. And I think it's just, you got to find the people that you want to be around, that you want to, uh, that you're fueled and it's like these, the same kind of matching energy. Um, you know, conflict is inevitable, whether you're in a kitchen or not in a kitchen or whether you're a chef and you're not a chef. But I think it's about having constructive conflict and understanding that everyone can have a different point of view and opinion, and that's okay as long as we respect the other side. And I think that, you know, if we all agreed in this world, to some extent, you know, there'd be less dynamic conversations in the world. Um, but if also on the other side, if we were able to actually talk about differences um, in a less divisive way, right. we'd actually get more accomplished. So I think there's, you gotta find that middle ground, but um, you know, I don't need to be surrounded by people that all agree with what I have to say, right. and that's okay as long as they respect what I have to say. I'm, I'm not a chef, but I'm a snob when it comes to egg sandwiches and how I, how I make my crab cakes. Okay. Um, and seafood well, salad. Well, and see, Baltimore, yeah, yeah. yeah we have, you have to like, you know, you have to have like your own recipe and identity sure. or like, you won't, they won't call you a Baltimorean, mm -hmm. they'll like, they'll take your idea away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there are certain dishes that you just don't mess with, right? Like, whether that's generational or in mm -hmm. your family, or if it's something you've developed on your own that you feel very proud of. But I love trying those dishes because there's so much, there's so much personality and storytelling and depth in those things. So your crab cake, we, we could probably share a crab cake and okay. talk eight hours about why you do what you do and why you love your version of the crab cake, um, and yeah. then we can go and taste another one. I, I won't. I won't let you jump in the harbor to get no. it because the water is kind of <laughs> I funky. I would do it for you. I would do it for you. What, what's your one dish that um, you don't want anyone to mess with? You know, I think coming from a, a perspective of a professional chef and having recipes, mm -hmm. I develop recipes that are meant to be played with. Um, I don't necessarily need you to cook like me, and that's okay. Uh, I'd rather you take the base an outline of something that I love and know very well mm -hmm. and then start messing with it and make it your own because you know food is everything has already been done before if we look at like a lot of a lot of recipe a lot of recipes and most techniques have already done been done before um, but what hasn't been done is imparting your story and something maybe that I created or me imparting my story and something you created then we're creating something completely different right. Um, and I think that's the beauty of food. It can bring and merge all these different kinds of people together. So beyond entertainment, um, do you have any goals for viewers? Um, mm. do, you, do you want us to like be more um, experimental with what we eat and, and where we go? You know, I think the beauty of restaurants at the end of the world is the fact that it is restaurants at the end of the world. And I am a chef and we're dealing with people that are cooking food for people. But really all intertwined and weaved through that story is just seeing how someone else does what they do. And I feel like whatever you can take away from it, whether that be a human thing or whether it inspires you to get more creative in the kitchen or whether that inspires you to go diving with polar bears, um, whatever you wanna take from it, I hope that someone can find something in it because I believe that there is something for everybody in this, in this show. Like feeding sack cocktail. Sure, yes, or. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Okay, so a ptarmigan is a is ptarmigan. A ptarmigan. ptarmigan. Yep. I was gonna, yeah, I was struggling with that. That's okay. I it took me a while to <laughs> understand how to say it. Um, so it is a Arctic grouse um, that has this mm. this feeding bag in its throat, and so over the winter time they'll or over the summertime they'll pick berries and little things off the fauna and you know all the all the things, save it, and if they can't find food during the winter, they'll regurgitate it and then swallow it. Yeah. for survival right like yeah. you got to do what you got to do right. to survive um that's and, amazing and like right? wow at the same time and the chef decided to take that because he didn't waste any part of the animal 
and infuse it in a gin and then make a cocktail out of it. Oh my God. So, you know, I am all for using all parts of the animal, animal but I was like, that one was, do we, ha should, <laughs> do we have to, like, do we have to do this? And it, for him, it was a yes. So I'm guessing that won't make it to Arlo Gray. Um, I personally did not like the flavor. <laughs> However, I was impressed by the innovation and creativity. Um, is any of these new uh, recipes or, or experiences going to make it back to your restaurant? You know, I don't think in terms of an actual dish on my menu, um, but you will see it because, you know, as a chef, when you are changed as a person, you cook differently. Okay. And I think it will evolve and things will kind of come about as time goes on. Maybe it won't be as obvious to me or, or the diner, um, but certainly being changed as a human d definitely does change you and how you decide to cook. Yeah, well, one thing the show is going to do is like challenge so many people into learning more about mm -hmm. where their food comes from and um, what different cultures do. So congratulations and tell everyone where they can see the show. Uh, so you can catch weekly episodes on National Geographic every Tuesdays. Check your local listings and then um, it will be streaming on and it is streaming on Disney Plus and Hulu. Thank you.